and welcome back to the 8-Bit Guy. Uh, this is an unplanned episode, and let me tell you how this began. So my friend Rob, you know him as the Obsolete Geek, was uh, traveling in Canton, Texas. Now, Canton is a good bit away from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I consider it to be in the middle of nowhere, but they are well known for their flea markets that they have on a regular basis. And uh, so Rob goes out there and he looks for vintage computer equipment. Most of the time he doesn't find anything, but you know, sometimes he does. Then he came across this VIC-20. And I mean, as you can see, it is in horrible condition. And um, the seller only wanted $5 for it. And so um, he decided to pick it up and uh, see if maybe I would consider trying to restore it. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, and here it is. Um, it is, uh, oh man, it's gross just to touch this thing. This is absolutely, without a doubt, the worst condition VIC-20 I have ever seen. But I'm gonna go further than that and say it might actually be the worst condition computer, period, that I've ever seen. And that says a lot because I used to work in an industrial environment in the IT department and I would have to go out in the shop all the time and work on these computers and the dust, uh, the atmosphere in the shop would just be full of, uh, I would call it shop dust or metal dust. It's basically just dust that comes from welding or grinding, and it's uh, just mostly iron, I think, but it would just collect all over everything and get inside of, of the computers, would just settle on the motherboards, which it was terrible. But you could usually just blow it off with some compressed air, and, and it would be more or less fine. This is different, and while, yes, it does have a lot of dust on it, if you look, at the back of this thing and you, you look in through like the cartridge and the user port and and you see the actual motherboard inside it is um it's got like some kind of nasty black oil or grease or something just all over it. and I, I haven't even taken this thing apart yet so i am i'm not sure what i'm gonna find when i open this thing up uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I, I'll, I'll tell you right now, I don't even know for sure if it's repairable. Uh, I have not even tried powering this thing on and I'm not even going to dare try to power it on until I've at least taken it apart and examined it and maybe cleaned it a little bit. So um, anyway, uh, let's dig in. Let's see what we can find. OK, so I want you to take a good look at this thing. Sure, it's dirty. I mean, we've all seen that before, but this is beyond dirty because it's covered in a thin layer of oil. And that's what's holding the dirt in place. I'm guessing this was used to operate industrial machinery during most of its life. One interesting thing about industrial machines is that whatever computer operates it must also coexist with the machine for the lifetime of that machine. So this VIC-20 could have been working for 15 or 20 years perhaps, probably until the machine was replaced, or until the computer broke and was replaced with another VIC-20. And as gross as this oil is, it shouldn't actually hurt the electronics. In fact, it may actually protect them against corrosion from moisture. That's why I think I can save this thing. Well, I guess I'll turn this thing over and start unscrewing it. Uh, normally I'd use a towel to help protect the top from scratches, but honestly, I don't want this thing touching any of my towels right now. It's worth pointing out, I noticed that we're actually missing three of the four feet, but that's no problem. I can replace those. Well, here it goes. Okay, it's pretty bad in here, but honestly not as bad as I was expecting. This is the later revision VIC-20 board that's shorter and doesn't fill the entire bottom of the computer. I'm gonna go ahead and take the board out. The board is attached to an RF shield. Ew, this is just nasty. Looks like there's some corrosion after all, and it's all over the RF shield. Hopefully it's just the shield and not the actual board. In all my years, I've only ever seen corrosion on par with this one time, and that was a musical keyboard I restored for 8-bit keys. And that one was caused by leaking batteries. I'm not sure what caused this. I have to wonder if this was in a flood or something. Well, we're going to need to remove this RF shield in order to see how bad the damage is. However, the shield is soldered to the board in several places. And it's tempting to want to cut these, but I'm going to try to desolder it. As I heat up the solder, I can immediately smell burning oil, which is an unusual thing to smell working on electronics. Unfortunately, I was not able to get it free this way, so after a few minutes, I decided to try a different approach. And even though that one was free, it turns out there are six more on the other side of the board that will require similar work. So I did get the board free, uh, but then I got to look at the cardboard that goes in between the board and the RF shield. It's totally soaked in oil. I I've never seen anything like this before. Well, let's have a look at the board itself. 
On the bright side, I don't see any corrosion on the back of the board, which is something I was worried about. Now I'll go ahead and pop off this RF shield for the video chip. I was hoping things would be cleaner in there since it was more protected, but it's just as nasty. Next, I'm going to remove the keyboard mechanism out of the top case. Both of these pieces will need to be separated to clean them properly. And here we go. My first thought was to blast these case pieces with the water hose. However, as I feared, it made very little difference overall. There were a few places that improved, maybe 20%, but, that, but that's all. Well, now instead of having just an oily computer, I have a wet and oily computer. So, lovely. As usual, my first attempt to clean this was with glass cleaner, as it's one of the most benign things I can use. However, it wasn't even making a dent. Next, I tried alcohol. And I could see that it was making a dent, but that's about all it was doing. You can definitely see some oil on this paper towel, but it seemed to be just smearing it around more than anything else. So my next approach was WD-40, which is ironic because it contains petroleum as well. However, as you can see, it made quite a big dent in the little test area that I tried it on. So that's certainly one candidate for cleaning this thing up. But before I went any further, I wanted to try baking soda to see if perhaps it would work better. And it actually did work, but I think WD-40 was working faster. So I just coated the entire computer in WD-40. The plan was I'd just rub it all over every surface and let it sit for a few minutes. I also put it on this corrosion inside, but I wasn't sure it would have any effect on that. After a few minutes, I came back and started scrubbing it. This was clearly going to improve the condition of the case, but I wasn't sure if this would be the only thing it needed. As always, I had to pay close attention to the little air vents up top. As I feared, the WD-40 had no effect on this nasty corrosion. But skipping ahead almost an hour, here's what we've got. The case is at least 50% improved, but a long way from where I want it to be. However, at least I can actually touch it now without having to go wash my hands afterwards. If you look closely, you can see lots of fine details that are going to need more work. And I still need to get off whatever this gunk is and clean up this corrosion. My next attempt was baking soda to clean the corrosion. I scrubbed and scrubbed for several minutes, but it really had no effect. So next I thought I'd try vinegar. I thought I'd pour some on there and let it sit there for a few minutes. I thought I'd start with one of those lighter areas to see if it had any effect there. However, the best I can tell, it had no effect. It's possible if I left it submerged for a few days in vinegar, it might eat this stuff away, but I don't have time for that. Next, I tried some deoxid. As you might have guessed, no effect. Next, I tried a magic eraser sponge. After all, if I didn't, I know people in the comments would be constantly asking why I didn't try one. Anyway, as you can see, it didn't really help any. Eventually, I decided that mechanical removal was likely going to be the only way to get this stuff off. And since it was on the inside of the case anyway, I wasn't too worried about possibly scratching the plastic. On the bright side, at least it appeared to be working. Uh, so let's clean up this little test area. Yeah, uh, that's going to work. And I don't even see any scratches in the plastic. I also had some success using an SOS pad to clean off some of the smaller remnants. Believe it or not, this is after about two hours of work on this corrosion. And to be honest, I had worn myself out on it, and I decided it wasn't worth messing with anymore since it was on the inside of the computer anyway. Next, I wanted to turn my attention to this gunk on top here. I suspected this was also going to require some mechanical removal. I worked on it for a few minutes with a screwdriver, and after the bulk of it was gone, I was able to follow up with some alcohol, and that cleared it up. Then I worked these vents for a while with a toothbrush. Next, I wanted to see if I could clear up the black residue from this case. So I thought I'd follow up with some baking soda and water over here in this corner. And uh, yeah, it looks like it's going to work. I'll branch out to a larger area. Okay, so you can see the test area I've been working on over here. Now these are burn marks, and I may try to sand or file those away later. But uh, I think overall the texture of the computer is going to be saved. Uh, I just have to do all the rest of it now. I also wanted to do something about this label. It's half falling off and it's no longer even centered in the place it's supposed to go, so I'm hoping I can save the label and clean it up and reapply it later. Ew, there's even oil under there. I'll just clean the adhesive off the other side of the label. Okay, so here's the case after more or less an entire day of working on it. It looks tremendously better, and the corrosion is in a place that nobody will ever see. However, uh, if you look on the bottom, I would point out that under the label, you can see the original color of the case, so it will definitely need some Retrobrite. But before I do that, I wanted to turn my attention to these burn spots. 
they're really you can feel them they're really deep and kind of ugly and I know I can't fix them but I'm gonna try using a little file here and see if I can improve the condition some. I worked on it very carefully for a few minutes and uh, you can see this made quite a dramatic improvement. So I went to work on the other spots as well. Okay, so here we go. It's not perfect of course, but I'd call that a 90% improvement and I'll take it. Also the original color of the plastic is showing through here, so hopefully after the Retrobrite it will all match. The next morning I set out my usual black crate and filled it with water. I had been letting the water warm up some before starting. However, it looks like I had a few inches too much water, so I dumped some of it out. Uh, you only want as much water as is needed to submerge, that way you will need less hydrogen peroxide. Okay, that looks about right. I'll pour in about half of this container. I'll save the other half for the bottom side of the Vic 20. To get the maximum greenhouse effect, I always try to cover it with something. In this case, I'm just going to use cling wrap as it's what I have on hand at the moment. Being it's about 90 degrees Fahrenheit today, the water temperature should rise to around 130 degrees like this, which is just about perfect. And while that's in progress, I thought I'd turn my attention to this keyboard. This is probably one of the nastiest keyboards I've ever had to work on. This restoration project has not gone exactly to plan. It's actually been considerably more difficult to do than I originally anticipated. Um, I thought the case would be the easiest thing to do and that the uh, keyboard and the motherboard would be the challenging things to do. But uh, so far the case, you know, I spent uh, three hours yesterday working on that case and I'm, I'm still sore up here in my arms. Uh, I feel like I'm the karate kid from all the wax on and wax off, you know, scrubbing that I did. And um, anyway, so if it's been that hard, um, I hope the uh, rest of it isn't more uh, difficult than I was imagining too. But uh, you know, there's something else I wanted to say. Um, so, you know, if you would have brought me this computer 10 years ago and said, David, restore this thing, I would have said, dude, throw that in the garbage. Put that poor thing out of its misery. And I knew people online who would say they've rescued their 45th Commodore 64 from the dumpster and they've got all these stored in their attic. And I would say, why? I mean, why are you wasting your time, you know, trying to rescue all of these old computers? Because, you know, when you die, your children or grandchildren are going to go through your house, they're going to throw all that junk away, and it's going to wind up in a landfill anyway. So why waste your time? Well, that was 10 years ago or more. I've obviously changed my opinion very much today, uh, and that's because I can see that uh, these computers have become um, collectible. So th they're worth saving now. And it's not that I have changed my opinion about these machines. I've always loved them. It's just that I knew, you know, from a practicality standpoint at the time, it seemed like uh, nobody else cared about them. And so I'm glad that uh, public perception on that has changed. And now it is... Uh, now, I do think it's worthwhile to not only rescue old computers, but when you find one that's in poor shape like this, uh, try to, you know, fix it up. I mean, uh, all of these deserve to be uh, restored, the ones that, that remain. So, uh, so we're done removing the keys, and uh, as I fear, there's like this nasty, it's not just dirt, that's actually like oil and dirt, and so it's really gross. Plus, we got the problem of this guy. Uh, this is a um, broken off stock, and I've got a spare I'm going to be getting from another system to fix that. But uh, before I even try to clean this, uh, because I'm going to need to take it apart, I'm going to go ahead and uh, unscrew all these little screws and um, take the board out. Right, so I'm actually curious um, how these are going to clean up. I'm going to, these are two of the more grimy ones. The control key actually looks pretty good, but the return key still looks a little dirty, so I'll follow it up with some alcohol. Okay, so after the alcohol, it looks pretty good now. I'm happy with that. Turning my attention to the motherboard, I wanted to try two products. So in my experience working on cars, I found that brake cleaner will pretty much instantly remove oil or grease from just about any surface. There's only one catch. It tends to discolor or in some cases destroy plastics or rubber. So before I go that route, uh, I went to the auto parts store to see if there was anything else that might work. And I came across several cleaner products, such as these that are for electronics. This one even says it is non-staining. So I took it outside and I gave it a good spray, focusing on uh, one area of the board for testing. Then I rinsed it off with the water hose. So looking at the result, I can see that it worked some and definitely loosened the grease. 
but it wasn't going as well as I wanted. So I went back and tried the brake cleaner, and I somehow lost the footage of the brake cleaner, but it literally cleaned this board in a matter of seconds. Uh, then I rinsed it with the hose again, and um, I used some compressed air to help get the water out of the connectors. And uh, this is what it looked like after the brake cleaner. It looks almost new again. Uh, putting that aside for the moment, I'm done cleaning all of the keys and they look very nice, but where am I going to get that extra key from that I need? Well, I got this old Commodore 64 parts machine uh, that's already missing a couple of keys. And it not only has the key I need, but I can get the plunger from the keyboard as well. However, after pulling the key, I realized when I compared it to a VIC-20 key that they're not the same after all. I mean, I knew the entire keyboards were compatible between the VIC-20 and C64, so I assumed the construction would be the same as well. In fact, looking inside this Commodore 64, I noticed some other differences here. See, the wires come out over here on the 64, but they come out down here on the VIC-20. Also, the shift lock key mechanism is different. Uh, nevertheless, I'm going to open this up because I'm hopeful maybe I can take the key and the matching plunger and it'll work in the VIC-20. So here's the key and it's matching plunger. I won't know if these will work until I disassemble the VIC-20 keyboard. And of course in order to do that I'm going to need to desolder the shift lock key and it's relatively straightforward and uh, when the time comes I'll put these wires back in the same way I took them out. After unscrewing all of the tiny screws, I realized I was going to have to remove this tape because there are some screws hiding underneath it. Well, here we go. And the bad news is, uh, the plungers are totally different, so this isn't going to work. But check out the oil on the PCB here. It's a perfect pattern showing the different keys. Anyway, I'm going to use brake cleaner on this as well, and since you didn't get to see it work on the motherboard, you can watch here and see how easily the oil just disappears off this thing. I'm also going to use brake cleaner on this plastic piece, even though I know it may discolor it. Okay, so it looks like it did discolor the plastic a little bit. It's uh, just kind of a faded white color now, but I'm not really that worried about it because uh, ultimately you're not going to really be able to see this, and I mean, it, uh, at least it is nice and clean now. So that might have a look at the little plungers. Uh, the one on the left is a fully operational plunger, and the one on the right here, of course, is the one that is destroyed. You can see how much of it is broken off. And, uh, you know, it might be possible to super glue the piece back on if you could find it, but it's it's long gone. Who knows where that is? So I do have an idea, though, as how to at least get this keyboard temporarily operational so that you can type on it. So um, let's let's do that. So I put all the little plungers back in their holes. And all the screws are put back in. I am going to leave these unsoldered for the moment uh, simply because uh, I'm going to be taking this back apart eventually. So the shift lock is not a essential key. Well guys, I hate to say it, but I'm going to have to leave you on a cliffhanger. This project has taken a lot longer than expected, and as you might have guessed, I ran into some problems with the motherboard. And so stick around in a few days for part two, and uh, you'll get to see some of the diagnostic work I did on the motherboard, and then uh, also uh, find out how the case turned out of the retrobriting. So uh, stick around for that, and thanks for watching.